the critical Supreme Court decisions that are involved in this. Now, with the background I've been giving you this morning, you ought to see that what's been happening with the Supreme Court is crazy. Everson versus Wall, 1947, that was the beginning of the bad stuff. They used the 14th Amendment, the court did, which was, which was used to ensure the civil rights of the freed slaves right after the Civil War. The 14th Amendment, they used it to apply the First Amendment to the states. This had never been done before. The Bill of Rights then is now being used to restrict the states. The Bill of Rights, if you read it, is restrictions on the federal government, not on the states. The Congress, the first Congress that passed the Bill of Rights, never intended for the states to be restricted. All of the powers not expressly delegated to the federal government are reserved to the states and to individual American citizens. Now here the court in 1947 totally violates the will of the American people because the Congress had before 1947 rejected six attempts Six times the Congress had rejected bills that were introduced that would apply the 14th Amendment, that would use the 14th Amendment to apply the First Amendment to the states. Now the First Amendment is the one that the court has used about this nonsense about the separation of church and state. The First Amendment has nothing to do with the separation of church and state. The First Amendment says, quote, Congress, so they're the only people that can violate it, a school kid can't violate the First Amendment. A school principal can't violate the First Amendment. A state official can't violate the First Amendment. Only the Congress of the United States can violate the First Amendment. All right? It's, which, I mean, this is crazy what's going on today. To try to make the First Amendment apply to all these different groups and so forth is bogus. It says, Congress shall make no law concerning the establishment of religion nor prohibit the free exercise thereof. Two clauses, the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause. All right? Now, it's crystal clear that when the court is applying, using the 14th Amendment to apply this First Amendment to the states, saying that therefore state public schools see, cannot have religion or prayer or Bible reading in the public schools. It is totally flying in the face of the will of the American people. Not only do the polls tell us that something like 84% of the American public wants prayer back in public school, but they're flying in the face of six attempts on the Congress. Six times the Congress said, no way can you use, shot them down six times. 1947, the court does this. Next case was Engel versus Vitali, 1962. This is the one that declared voluntary non-denominational prayer in schools to be unconstitutional. This is the one that took prayer out of public school. Now, folks, this is the first time in American history that religion was separated from education. Prior to 1962, we have 342 years of American history, back to 1620 when the pilgrims arrived, for 342 years, never had any court in the United States ruled a school activity unconstitutional. For 342 years, circuit courts, appellate courts, the whole system never had any court ruled a school activity like prayer or Bible reading unconstitutional for 342 years. Now, if it is so obvious that the First Amendment renders prayer and Bible reading unconstitutional, if you can get that out of the First Amendment, which is ludicrous, but if you could do it, how come it never showed up in any court cases for 342 years? This is insane. Education has now become the battleground of church and state. Abraham Lincoln said, the philosophy of the schoolroom in one generation will become the philosophy of the government in the next. 
Exactly right. The philosophy of the schoolroom in one generation will become the philosophy of the government in the next. Bill Clinton is a 1960s flowers child. He was educated with all of the 60s humanistic philosophy. So why in the world should we be so surprised with what he's producing in Washington? He's just doing what he was taught. <laughs> Wallace versus Jaffrey, 1984, that's when the Supreme Court struck down the one moment of silence idea. 1984. Now, they cited 200 cases in 1984. 200 cases to try to buttress their position. <laughs> From before 1947, there were only 22. About 10% of the cases were before World War II about the separation of church and state or supposedly bad stuff like prayer and Bible reading in public school. They couldn't find anything. So what they did was they were citing themselves. All of the cases they were citing, 178 of them, were between 1947 and 1984 when the court had embarked on this craziness. So all they were doing was saying, oh, well, of course, this is perfectly legal to do because, you know, 10 years ago we said, and they were quoting themselves. Now, this is totally bogus. You can't build court precedent on what you said, you know, last week. That doesn't work. Now, the court, the Supreme Court these days, tries to make the founding fathers speak for this craziness. They try to make Madison and Jefferson speak for it. Let's go back and see what Madison and Jefferson actually said about the Supreme Court. What are the founding fathers? what was their attitude about the Supreme Court this will blow your mind listen to this Thomas Jefferson letter to Samuel Miller 1808 I consider the government of the United States as prohibited by the Constitution from meddling with religious institutions their doctrines discipline or exercises this results not only from the provision that no law shall be made respecting an establishment or free exercise of religion quoting the First Amendment but from that also which reserves to the states the powers not delegated to the general government. That's the Tenth Amendment. It must then rest with the states as far as it can with any human authority. What's Jefferson telling us? See, the federal government has no business messing with the schools. They are the responsibility of the states, the various states. Thomas Jefferson to Abigail Adams, 1804. The opinion which gives the judges the right to decide what laws are constitutional and what are not, not only for themselves and their own sphere of action, but for the legislature and the executive also in their spheres, would make the judiciary a despotic branch. Now, do you hear what Jefferson is saying? He's saying the Supreme Court of the United States has no right to tell the executive branch, the president, or the Congress that what they've done is unconstitutional. They have no right to do that. And they do it all the time. And as far as the Founding Fathers are concerned, this is not constitutional. We have a system of three equal branches of the federal government. The Supreme Court has no right to tell one of the other two branches they can't do what they've done. American government doesn't function the way the Constitution says it's supposed to anymore. And it's clearly against the intention of the Founding Fathers. Jefferson to William Jarvis, 1820. You seem to consider the judges as the ultimate arbiters of all constitutional questions. And I want to tell you, the Supreme Court justices in the last 30 years have claimed this publicly over and over. Well, it's up to us to decide. Hogwash. Jefferson said, that this guy William Jarvis wrote Jefferson and said that same kind of thing to him. This is Jefferson's response. You seem to consider the judges as the ultimate arbiters of all constitutional questions. A very dangerous doctrine indeed. And one which would place us under the despotism of an oligarchy. As, you know, nine men. He goes on to say, the germ of dissolution of our federal government is in the federal judiciary. An irresponsible body, working like gravity by night and by day, gaining a little today and a little tomorrow, and advancing its noiseless step like a thief over the field of jurisdiction until all shall be usurped from the states and the judges as the ultimate arbiters of all constitutional questions. This is a very dangerous doctrine indeed. James Madison. 
As the courts are generally the last in making the decision on laws, it results to them by refusing or not refusing to execute a law to stamp it with its final character. This makes the judiciary department paramount, in fact, to the legislature, which was never intended and can never be proper. The framers never intended the Constitution to be interpreted the way the court has done recently. Here's a quote from George Washington about the separation of church and state. Listen to this. If I could ever have entertained the slightest apprehension that the Constitution framed by the convention where I had the honor to preside might possibly endanger the religious rights of any ecclesiastical society, I certainly never would have placed my signature on it. Congress. 1853, the Senate Judiciary Committee made the following statement. Congress of the United States, 1853. Had the people during the revolution had a suspicion of any attempt to war against Christianity, that revolution would have been strangled in its cradle. At the time of the adoption of the Constitution and the amendments, the universal sentiment was that Christianity should be encouraged, not any one sect. Now this will blow your mind. In the 1962 Engel versus Vitale decision that removed prayer, Bible reading for public school, in that decision there were no prior cases cited whatsoever. Not one. Because there were none to come up with. That Supreme Court, folks, had not one justice with any prior judicial experience. I'm telling you, not one of those nine Supreme Court justices had ever been a judge. Not one. Now, how in heaven's name can we expect, expect men who had never even been a judge to understand the Constitution of the United States? Those judges were political just those justices were political judges, not constitutional judges. As Edwin S. Corwin pointed out in the Constitution of the United States, this court, which during its tenure was able to completely remove God from education by a series of horrific decisions, did not have a single judge with any prior judicial experience. Despite the oath the justices take when entering office, the court did not intend to follow the original intent and uphold the Constitution. In Everson versus Wall, 1947, the Supreme Court said, quote, neither a state, listen to this insanity, neither a state nor the federal government can pass laws which aid one religion, aid all religions, or prefer one religion over another. But the earlier courts obviously preferred the Christian faith. Runkel versus Weinmiller, 1799. Quote, by our form of government, the Christian religion is the established religion, and all sects and denominations of Christians are placed upon the same equal footing. They were simply not, they were deliberately refusing to follow prior court decisions that clearly indicate the Christian faith is the basis for American life. Stone versus Graham, 1980. This was the case that removed the, Supreme, the Ten Commandments from the classroom wall. Said it was illegal to put the Ten Commandments up on the schoolroom wall anymore. Stone versus Graham, 1980. The court said, quote, that if the Ten Commandments were posted up on the wall, the effect would be, quote, this, this will make you, this will break your heart. The, the effect would be to induce the school children to read, meditate upon, perhaps to venerate and obey the commandments. And this is not a permissible state objective under the First Amendment. James Madison, the chief architect of that very amendment, said, We have staked the whole of our political institutions on the capacity of mankind to govern themselves according to the Ten Commandments. And the Supreme Court says, Obeying the Ten Commandments is not a permissible state objective. And Madison said the whole thing is based on the Ten Commandments. I mean, this is a total rejection of everything America was founded on. Proof that the First Amendment was never intended to separate Christianity from public policy is revealed very clearly by the fact that on the very same day that the Congress approved the First Amendment, 
they also approved the Northwest Ordinance, which established the government, the beginnings of government, for the territories north and west of the Ohio River, which would be the states of Ohio, Illinois, Michigan, Indiana, and so forth. All right? The third clause of the Northwest Ordinance says, Religion, morality, and knowledge being essential for the happiness of mankind, schools and the means of education shall be forever encouraged. The Congress of the United States is saying the schools are to encourage religion and morality as well as knowledge. Now, folks, the Founding Fathers would have had to be totally schizophrenic, I mean totally schizoid, okay, to have passed that on the same day they passed the First Amendment, if in their minds the First Amendment had been, had been intended to, to use to separate church and state, they never would have passed that, that Northwest Ordinance with that third clause that says the schools are to encourage religion and morality. I mean, this doesn't make any sense. This very same day. <clears throat> very same day. On September 10th, 1782, the Congress approved, this is a quote, and recommended to the people the Holy Bible printed by Robert Aiken of Philadelphia. A neat edition of the Holy Scriptures for the use of schools. <laughs> so the Congress of the United States, in September 10th, 1782, is saying, the schools in the United States need to use this edition of the Holy Bible. Another point, the delegates to the Constitutional Convention had already taken an oath to their own state constitutions. Every state constitution in the United States by 1787 mandated that every elected official in that state had to swear to a belief in the Holy Trinity. You could not hold office unless you were a Christian, unless you believed in the Holy Trinity and believed in the Scriptures. Now, unless they were committed to being Christians, they could not have been delegates to the Constitutional Convention in the first place. They couldn't even have gotten there. Does it make any sense to you that those Christian men sitting there in the Constitutional Convention are going to create a Constitution that says it doesn't matter if you're a Christian? Their state constitutions had sworn them to Christian faith. <laughs> they had taken an oath to uphold the Christian faith. We would find some evidence in the constitutions or laws of their various states about this separation of church and state thing, it would be in their state constitutions. If the present day ideas about the separation of church and state had been in the minds of the founding fathers in the Constitutional Convention, we would have found some evidence of that in these state constitutions they had just taken oaths to uphold. There's no such evidence. To the contrary, all of those state constitutions, with no exceptions, require that you have to be a believer in the Holy Trinity to hold office. It doesn't make any sense. Those men would never have created a constitution that separated church and state. They'd come from states where obviously that, the exact opposite was the case. Now, is there evidence since the founding to refute all this nonsense? You bet your life. Supreme Court, Holy Trinity versus U.S., 1892. Quote, no purpose of action against religion can be imputed to any legislation, state or national, because this is a religious people. Our laws and institutions must necessarily be based upon the teachings of the Redeemer of mankind. Do you hear that? This is the Supreme Court of the United States, 1892. Our laws and institutions must necessarily be based upon the teachings of the Redeemer of mankind. It is impossible that it should be otherwise. And in this sense, and to this extent, our civilization and our institutions are emphatically Christian. This is historically true. From the discovery of this continent to the present hour, there is a single voice making this affirmation that this is a Christian nation. We are founded to legislate, propagate, and secure Christianity. That's the Supreme Court, 1892. 
and they say they can't find any precedent to uphold the idea that uh, America is a Christian nation. In, in the Abner Updegraff case of 1824 in Pennsylvania, Abner Updegraff was, con- was arrested, tried, and convicted of blasphemy in the state of Pennsylvania because he said the scriptures were a mere fable. The Supreme Court of Pennsylvania upheld his conviction. And even his defense lawyers who used the First Amendment arguments of freedom of speech that everybody uses today. That's the only defense they could find for Abner Updegraff. But his defense lawyers publicly stated in the court that they were that, that he was wrong in what he said, that it was scandalous that he had said it, that they were very upset with what he had said, but they would give him a good defense anyway because every citizen is entitled to one. But his defense lawyers wanted to go on record with the court. <laughs> as saying that personally they were horrified at what he had said. And he was convicted, and his conviction was upheld, convicted for blasphemy. Now that is the that shows you the strong Christian consensus in America. You know, as late as the 1820s, it was there, all right. People versus Ruggles, the state from the the case from the Supreme Court of New York State, the Chief Justice of the New York State Supreme Court, Kent, noting in this case that this case assumes, quote, that we Americans are a Christian people and the morality of the country is deeply engrafted on Christianity. 1952, you get real up to date. Zorak versus Clausen. The United States Supreme Court said, quote, this is the William O. Douglas Court, quote, we are a religious people whose institutions presuppose a supreme being. When the state encourages religious instruction or cooperates with the religious authorities by adjusting the schedule of public events to sectarian needs, it follows the best of our traditions. 1952. The New York Spectator newspaper of August 23, 1831, reported from the Court of Common Pleas of Chester County, New York, that a witness was rejected from testifying in the court case because he declared his disbelief in God. The presiding judge remarked, quote, This belief constitutes the sanction of testimonies in a court of justice, that he knew of no cause in a Christian country where a witness had been permitted to testify without belief in God. Justice Joseph Story of the United States Supreme Court, who knew many of the Founding Fathers, was a close personal friend of Chief Justice John Marshall, wrote his famous commentaries on the Constitution in 1833. Now, this was absolute, mandated, required reading for every law student in America up until very recently. Justice Story, a famous Supreme Court justice. Quote, Listen to this. I've got two more quotes from you. This from him, from Justice Story, Joseph Story, and Chief Justice Rehnquist in today's court. And we're almost through here. Quote, We are not to attribute this prohibition of a national religious establishment in the First Amendment to an indifference to religion in general, and especially to Christianity, which none could hold in more reverence than the framers of the Constitution. Probably at the time of the adoption of the Constitution and of the amendments to it, the general, if not universal, sentiment in America was that Christianity ought to receive encouragement from the state. Any attempt to level all religions and make it a matter of state policy to hold all in utter indifference would have created universal disapprobation, if not universal indignation. It yet remains a problem to be solved in human affairs, whether any free government can be permanent, where the public worship of God and the support of religion constitute no part of the policy or the duty of the state in any recognizable shape. And here's Chief Justice Rehnquist. This is from the recent Alabama court case, I think, one or two years ago. Present Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. Quote, Thank God for him. There is simply no historical foundation for the proposition that the framers intended to build a wall of separation. There is overwhelming evidence that all the founders meant by that was that we not establish a national church as was found in England. 
There is statement after statement, even from the constitutional notes themselves and all sorts of other people who were involved with it, that this is what was meant. It is impossible to build sound constitutional doctrine upon a mistaken understanding of constitutional history. The wall of separation between church and state is a metaphor based on bad history. A metaphor which has proved useless as a guide to judging. It should be frankly and explicitly abandoned. He goes on to point out that the first Congress that passed the Bill of Rights also passed the first public declaration of thanksgiving and prayer. This was done the very same day they approved and set up the First Amendment. Now, they had quite a day. They passed the Northwest Ordinance. They passed the First Amendment. They passed a, a declaration of a day of prayer and thanksgiving. And George Washington declared this day at the request of both the Senate and the House. And Washington said, quote, a day of public thanksgiving and prayers to be observed by acknowledging with grateful hearts the many and signal favors of Almighty God. Rehnquist concludes, history must judge whether it was the father of our country, Washington, plus the majority of the House of Representatives and the Senate who were correct in their understanding of the First Amendment or whether, whether it is a majority of the court today. The problem is the courts become a law unto itself. Abraham Lincoln. I do not forget the position assumed by some that constitutional questions are to be decided by the Supreme Court. At the same time, the candid citizen must confess that if the policy of the government upon vital questions affecting the whole people is to be irrevocably fixed by decisions of the Supreme Court, the instant they are made, the people will have ceased to be their own rulers, having resigned their government into the hands of that eminent tribunal. That's what's been happening to us. Lastly, a quote from Richard John Newhouse. <clears throat> we are two nations, one concentrated on rights and laws, the other on rights and wrongs. One radically individualistic, dedicated to the actualized self. Got to do what's best for me. The other communal and invoking the common good. One viewing law as the instrument of the will to power and license, the other affirming an objective moral order reflected in a constitution to which we are obliged. One given to private satisfaction, the other to familial responsibility. One typically secular, the other typically religious. One elitist, the other populist. No other question cuts so close to the heart of the culture wars as the question of abortion. The abortion debate is about more than abortion. It is about the nature of human life and community. It is about whether rights are the product of human assertion or the gift of nature and nature's God. It is about euthanasia, eugenic engineering, and the protection of the radically handicapped. <clears throat> the 1992 Casey decision of the U.S. Supreme Court last year, Liberty is no longer the ordered liberty of the founders, nor is it liberty directed to the good and formed by communities of memory and obligation. According to the court, liberty is now the liberty of self-will, self-expression, and self-constitution. Selfish is exactly right, son. Against alternative understandings of the self in relation to community, normative truth, and even revelation, the court recognizes no other reality these days than the isolated individual defining his or her reality. We've lost our sense of covenant and community. That's what I've been teaching you all week. All of this means that the only hope for America is the recovery of our basic Judeo-Christian moral and spiritual foundations.